Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Edna Day. And I'm Emily Sue. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Tycoon Lee Kaching seeks to take over UK mobile phone operator O2 for more than $119 billion. Vice President Lee Yuan Chao says best is yet to come in battle against Occupy movement. Saudi Arabia mourns death of King Abdullah, who pushed for reforms, although slow and limited. Tycoon Lee Ka-shing is set to buy British mobile phone giant O2 for more than 119, Hong Kong, uh, 119 billion Hong Kong dollars in the biggest telecom deal he has made so far. The deal has added to speculation that Hong Kong's richest man is trying to move his business interests overseas. Lee Ka-shing is making another big business move just a fortnight after announcing an overhaul of his empire and re-registering two new flagship companies outside Hong Kong. His Hutchison Wampoa confirmed today it's seeking to buy British mobile phone operator O2 for more than 119 billion Hong Kong dollars. They've already agreed on the initial price of more than $107 billion in cash and another installment of more than $11 billion will be paid further down the road. The timing and amounts of these payments will depend on the actual cash flows of the combined businesses, Hutchison told the local stock exchange in a statement. Shares in the company surged by 3 percent on the news closing at $101.20 today. The deal has added to the buzz that the city's richest man may be trying to pull his business interests out of Hong Kong and the mainland, although he has repeatedly denied it. There's also speculation that the tycoon is no longer the darling of China's leaders, recent mainland media reports suggesting it won't matter all that much if he does business elsewhere. If the deal goes all the way through, Lee will run the UK's biggest mobile phone operator. Hutchison already operates phone services in the UK, Italy, Sweden, Denmark, Austria and Ireland through its three-group Europe, which has nearly 27 million customers. Vice President Li Yun Chao has been quoted as declaring that the best is yet to come in the struggle against Hong Kong's civil disobedience movement. He reportedly called for vigilance, warning that the organizers of last year's Occupy protests have yet to reach their goals. An article posted online by the web portal Hong Kong Macau News has raised eyebrows by quoting Vice President Li Yuan Chao on last year's Occupy protests. It quoted Li as declaring recently that the anti-Occupy struggle is not over yet and the best is yet to come. The vice president went on to say that the brains behind the civil disobedience campaign have not reached their goals yet. But he praised the central and SAR governments, along with supporters of the Love China, Love Hong Kong slogan for having achieved victory at this stage. He also warned everyone to keep in mind how protesters and young people had behaved during the road blockades and urged all sides to oppose their campaign. Last year's chaos and lawlessness have reignited the debate on national security laws for Hong Kong. On the airwaves today, University of Hong Kong law professor Johannes Chan joined a growing chorus of rejection for a proposal by Stanley Ng, a local deputy to China's parliament, to have the mainland apply its own national security legislation to the SAR. The legal experts slammed the idea as unconstitutional and reckless, as Article 23 of the Basic Law already provides for Hong Kong itself to introduce such legislation. Chan said the reason why there is such a clause is because Hong Kong people don't want China to apply its laws here directly. On another radio show, pro-establishment lawmaker Lam Tai Fai accused the government of not trying hard enough to forge a consensus with the opposition camp on political reform. I don't see the government really getting in touch with the pan-democrats, said Lam. When they do promotions in the community, they tend to focus on consulting groups that are friendlier with the government. The government-appointed committee looking into standard working hours for Hong Kong has set up another group to take it further after a 10th meeting. Lawmakers have slammed the delay as unacceptable, but the committee says it's a complicated issue. ATV's Winner Wang reports. 
It's the tenth time that the Standard Working Hours Committee has met, but there's still nothing concrete on the way forward. According to Committee Chairman Leung Che Hung, today's meeting concluded that legislation is needed for working hours, but how to go about it will be left to a new task force to be set up. Leung denied that the committee has been dragging its feet, arguing that the issue is complicated. Public feedback suggests that it's not just employers who are hesitant. Employees themselves are worried their income will be reduced if their working hours are limited, he noted. A final report will be handed to the government in March next year. But lawmakers find this unacceptable. So it's study after study and study after study, and never, you know, there's had any uh, sincerity in having working hour regulation. And so we are really very uh, angry that the fact that Hong Kong workers as long as working hours uh, in the world and that they can never uh, uh, still yet any possibility of a work-life balance uh, for the workers in Hong Kong. The veteran union has suggested the government is deliberately delaying the issue for the next administration, with ledge co-elections due next year and the chief executive poll after that. Federation of Trade Unions legislator Chan Yun Han is also unhappy about the lack of progress. The government should refer to nearby areas because even China has a minimum wage and standard working hour laws, she said. Union leaders are accusing Chief Executive Lan Chenying of failing to deliver his election manifesto pledge to sort out the issue. Wen Wang, ATV News. Hong Kong has confirmed its second imported human case of H7N9 bird flu. The patient has been isolated for treatment at Princess Margaret Hospital after visiting the mainland. Details will be announced later tonight. The first infection was confirmed last month. The patient had visited Shenzhen where she ate chicken. The health minister has warned that this winter could turn out to be one of the worst flu seasons, as severe cases of infection are mounting. He's worried about the ability of public hospitals to cope with the surge and is urging people to get vaccinated. Here's Wen Wong. With Hong Kong in the peak winter season for influenza, public hospitals are bracing for an influx of patients. According to the health minister, this year's numbers are comparable with those of last year in 2012, in which an exceptionally high number of flu patients showed serious symptoms. During those two years, half of the 200 to 300 patients admitted to intensive care units died of seasonal flu. Three weeks into this year's peak flu season, around 80 severely ill patients have been put under intensive care and nearly half have died, most of them infected by the H3N2 strain. Uh, I'm more concerned about the uh, capacity of the public hospital, um, say in the A&E department, as well as in the intensive care unit. So uh, we'll be uh, liaising with the hospital authority to make sure that they have um, the um, measures in hand to uh, handle the situation. Adding to concerns this year, the vaccine being used locally targets an H3N2 strain that is different from the one going around. But the health minister says it's still better than nothing. Uh, we also advise people to take the influenza vaccine, although uh, the protection rate uh, of the combination uh, that we use this year is apparently lower than uh, past years. Uh, experts were of the opinion that um, uh, the, uh, having the um, vaccination is still better uh, than not. Wena Wang, ATV News. Overseas, Thailand's military-backed legislature has banned ousted Prime Minister Yingle Shinawat from politics for five years for alleged corruption. The country's first woman premier also faces trial over a controversial rice subsidy scheme. ATV's Arthur Erkaola reports. The result came as no surprise to many as Thailand's National Legislative Assembly voted overwhelmingly to impeach former Prime Minister Yingle Shinawat and ban her from politics for five years. Thailand's first women premier was called to account for her role in a controversial rice subsidy scheme. Farmers who are among her most fervent supporters sold their rice to the government at higher than market prices. But this resulted in massive stockpiles in warehouses. Almost 4 million tons of grain were spoilt, causing the government 20 billion U.S. dollars. Yingluck was accused of mismanaging the scheme. 
but she disputed the accusations, saying the program had in fact improved the economy and raised the standard of living for Thailand's rural poor. Her supporters had expected the result and accused the military-appointed lawmakers of being biased in the pursuit of their vendetta against Yingluck and her family. It was the second blow to the former leader today. Earlier, the Attorney General announced Yingluck will face a criminal charge in connection with the rice program. She could be jailed for up to 10 years and found guilty of negligence of duty. Today's developments are expected to increase tension in the divided country. Yingluck's mainly rural backers believe she's being persecuted by the military and the middle class to stop her family from returning to power. Her opponents have also been targeting her brother, Taksin, a former prime minister himself now living in exile. Last year, Thailand was plagued by months of street protests between supporters and opponents of the premier. The unrest subsided after she was removed as prime minister for abuse of power in May last year. Days later, the military seized power, and Thailand has been under martial law ever since. Arthur Rikiola, ATV News. Saudi Arabia's King Abdullah has died at the age of 90 and has been succeeded by his half-brother, Prince Salman. Abdullah was known for pushing for stability in the Middle East, as well as limited reforms to improve rights in the oil-rich kingdom. Here's Arthur Rikiola. Saudi Arabia, the world's largest oil-producing country, is mourning the death of King Abdullah bin Abdulaziz. The monarch, who ascended the throne nearly a decade ago, died in a Riyadh hospital at the age of 90, several weeks after he was admitted with a lung infection. For many in the kingdom and abroad, Abdullah is regarded as a cautious reformist. He took on conservative clerics who promoted an intolerant Islamist message. And he tore down barriers in the ultra-conservative country by giving women opportunities in education and employment that they had been denied previously. Women will also be able to take part in municipal elections this year and sit on the council that advises the government on new laws. But dramatic as these reforms may seem in a male-dominated society, Saudi Arabia still lags behind many nations in women's rights. Saudi women are banned from driving and need approval from a male relative for many things, including opening a bank account or undergoing some types of surgery. U.S. President Barack Obama led a string of world leaders in paying homage to Abdullah, saying he had a steadfast and passionate belief in the importance of the U.S.-Saudi relationship. Oil was the cornerstone of the special ties between the two countries. As a major player, Saudi Arabia was able to control prices by raising or reducing production. U.S. presidents realizing the clout the Saudis possess opened their doors to Abdullah, George W. Bush in 2005, and later his successor, Obama. Abdullah is succeeded by his half-brother Salman, who is expected to continue his predecessor's policies. Arthur Rikiola, 